Sciences and the Vice Provost for Academic Operations. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our first Windows on the World presentation of this academic year. I, I'm just curious, how many of you here this morning are attending your first Windows event? Please raise your hands. Okay, a couple, good. Some even walking in. <clears throat> on our university website, we declare Windows, or describe Windows this way. Windows on the World is intended to stimulate personal involvement in and knowledge of some of the crucial and controversial issues facing Christians today. Through these forums, the campus community is exposed to Christian thinkers and activists who model our motto of the whole gospel for the whole world. We'd like to think that Windows gives us a glimpse into the very DNA of Eastern. We are a community that is committed to pursuing faith, reason, and justice. We are people who love and follow Jesus, who seek to love the Lord our God with our mind, and who seek to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. That pursuit is not easy, and it's messy, but we welcome you to walk with us on that pilgrimage. One housekeeping uh, item before I relinquish the microphone. After this morning's presentation, there is a luncheon planned in Baird Library up in Walton Hall starting at 1130. I extend to you an invitation to come and uh, extend that conversation. No doubt our speaker today will say some things that will be of interest to you. I'd like to ask her some questions. Please feel free to do that. You're invited to come, and we hope to see many of you there. For you students, if you can come for part of the time and you can't come for the rest, that's great. Uh, we'll start at 1130. We'll end at 1245. If you're here without a meal plan, please uh, give your name to the cashier in the dining commons and uh, mention that you're with the Windows Luncheon and you'll be extended an unbelievable deal of $5 uh, for that lunch. One of our partners in Windows presentations has been true last year and is true this year is Red Letter Christians. And so I'd like to uh, introduce to you Shane Claiborne, who along with Tony Campolo founded Red Letter Christians. Shane will introduce our Windows speaker this morning. Shane. Sweet. It's great to be together, and uh, we're delighted to support these Windows uh, events. So what, what, the way that works is um, we've been having two speakers every semester that Red Letter Christians brings in, and uh, these are friends of ours. They're folks that love Jesus and care about justice. Uh, last semester... We had uh, Mark, Mark Charles, who is a native theologian, talk about the doctrine of discovery. Drew Hart, uh, a black activist uh, and theologian, and a blacktivist, he calls himself, and he talked about uh, the movement for black lives and racial justice. Jenny Yang, you are going to be incredibly gifted to hear this morning. I'll introduce her, but we've been making these shirts. I brought you one, Jenny. Um, uh, just to create a few jobs in the neighborhood and get a good message out. So this one, um, the official flag code is that you can fly, fly the flag upside down in times of dire distress. So we've got the flag code with the distress signal on it, and that's for you. And uh, I, I brought another one, um, which is for you, one of you all that wears a medium um, and this is the prayer of Francis, which we're going to pray in just a second. So who wears a medium and wants this shirt? Okay, good. Gotcha. Um, I'm just going to throw it and you got to fight over it. But it is, it is about peace and love, okay? Um, so, um, and, and I really do want to encourage you to come for the lunch so we can really unpack some of this. Um, and Jenny has is, is, um, been really gracious to come. She's going to stir some beautiful stuff up. And I also want to say that um, in our area, sometimes you hear these things, and you're like, well, what can I do right where I am? And the incredible thing is, especially related to the things Jenny's going to say, is we've got a lot happening in the Philadelphia area around immigration and refugees. There's a powerful movement called the New Sanctuary Movement that is uh, uh, driven by many uh, people of faith that's uh, concerned about the stuff Jenny's going to be talking about. Yesterday, had hundreds and hundreds of us that gathered uh, at City Hall uh, to pray and think about DACA, um, this uh, policy, you know, that affects 800,000 uh, uh, immigrant dreamers and families here. And um, so 
I'm going to stop there and just say that Jenny Yang is a friend. She's a part of Red Letter Christian. She's an incredible voice in the church and in the world. She's the vice president of uh, advocacy and policy at World Relief. Um, she's done research for the UN. She's uh, advised the U.S. government on different policies. She's uh, worked on refugee protection, immigration policy, and human rights for over a decade. Wrote a great book uh, with a friend called Welcoming the Stranger. It's an amazing book on some of this if you want to explore it more deeply. She's also been named 50 Women to Watch by Christianity Today, Seven Leaders to Follow in 2017 by Relevant Magazine, and this is her first time at Eastern. So give her a hand. Come on up, Jenny, and I'll, I'll pray the, the prayer of Francis as we get going. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, let me shine light, and where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 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 All right, Jenny Yang. Well, I've respected Shane for many years now, and when you uh, get to be introduced by someone like him, who's one of the best activists I know, um, it's really an honor, so thank you so much, Shane. So immigration, it, you know, it's non-controversial. It's never been in the news. Um, this is something that, obviously, for many of us, um, it's a very hot topic of conversation. Um, so I really have the honor of really talking with you about this topic, not just from a political or an economic or a social perspective, but fundamentally from a Christian perspective. Um, for me, when we talk about the issue of immigration, it's profoundly personal. Um, I am the daughter of immigrants. I actually was born right here in the city of Philadelphia. So that means I am a diehard Eagles fan, Phillies fan. Um, you know, it goes down the list. Um, and so my parents live about 30 minutes from here. And my whole life experience being an American, being an Asian American, being a Christian American has actually been fundamentally shaped by my identity as being the daughter of immigrants. Now, my parents immigrated here um, back in the early, late 1970s, and my father has a fascinating story because he's the little boy in the white cap, um, and this is the only photo he has of himself as a little child. Um, and the reason for that is because when he was just three years old, it was actually the beginning of the Korean War in South Korea, and he remembers communist soldiers literally knocking on the door of his house and looking for his father and my grandfather, who was a reporter at that time. Now, the communists, the first people they were targeting during the beginning of the war were media personnel, and so they rem uh, my dad remembers getting the knock on the door, being pushed aside by soldiers, the, reporter, uh, the soldiers going up, finding my grandfather, and my dad never saw him again. And so that's when he was about three years old. Now, a few years after that, it was just him and his mom, and his mom became really, really sick. Um, and so she actually passed away uh, when he was just seven years old. Now, what was interesting about my grandmother is that she came to faith because of American missionaries that were coming to Korea in hordes at that time. And so one thing that she did do before she passed away was she gave my father a Christian faith. And so after my grandmother passed away, he clung onto his faith and prayed and prayed and prayed. And one of the prayers that he prayed was that he would actually come to the United States of America because he felt like as if he came here, that he wouldn't actually be defined by his poverty and that this was a land of golden opportunity. But as a poor, young, single, you know, Korean boy, he didn't know what it was going to take for him to get here. Now, one of the things he became really good at was he became really good at fixing cars. And so he entered a national car repair competition, won first place. One of the judges noticed him and said, hey, do you want to come to America with me? And this was his golden ticket. So he actually got a visa um, to work at the Ford Motor Company. He came actually to Philly. Um, he opened up his own business. So especially for all of you who are in Philly, if your car ever breaks down, my dad is an amazing mechanic that lives, that has a shop like right down the street on Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, he's actually semi-retired now. 
But the reason I share the story of my father is because his experience as someone who suffered persecution as a young child, um, whose family was killed during a war, um, and who immigrated to this country is a remarkable story that reflects the human side of what we call the migration crisis and even the refugee crisis. Um, and what's ironic about this one picture that my dad has of himself as a kid is that that's a stark contrast to the over 13,000 pictures I have of my own son on my phone. Um, and so when I know that this is the only photo my dad has of himself, I just think, man, I mean, that's pretty interesting. And this is really the only uh, memory of physical memory um, that I can even see of my dad when he was a little boy. Now, right now, um, as we talk about the refugee crisis, it's really important to talk about what is actually happening around the world and to understand that this is an issue um, and the migration of people is not just something that's impacting the United States of America. In fact, we are actually minimally impacted by the refugee crisis. But right now, there's estimated to be 65 million people around the world who have actually lost everything um, and are fleeing for their lives into another country. This is the largest number of people who have been displaced since World War II, which means before that time, or since that time, we haven't seen greater numbers of displaced, people displaced really um, in generations. And so if you look at the total numbers of people who have been persecuted and are fleeing from their homes, it's actually greater than the, the population of the United Kingdom or of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand combined, which means that the number of refugees and internally displaced persons can actually make up an entire nation. And if you estimate the rate at which people are fleeing, literally since I started my conversation, there's probably several hundred people somewhere around the world that have been forced to flee from their homes. Now we may be thinking, well, what is the reason for us experiencing such a high number of people who are actually being forced to flee from their homes? And the United Nations basically said that it's due to three reasons. The first is that conflicts are actually lasting a lot longer than people anticipated. Uh, many of us know what's happening in Syria. We've seen the devastation of chemical attacks against the Syrian children and against Syrian families. And what's interesting is if you actually go um, to the Middle East or even hear the stories of many of these Syrian refugees, they most all thought that they would actually be able to go back to Syria within two or three years. In fact, some of the Syrian refugees that I met in the Middle East still have the keys to their homes because they felt like they're going to be able to go home. But little did they know that the conflict was going to last, you know, five, six, seven years now. And so they still have a hope of returning, but many of them understand that this is a protracted conflict, which is not going to see a resolution at probably any time in the next maybe three to five years. But what we also see is that conflicts are actually happening more frequently. So not only do we see the Arab Springs in the Middle East, but we saw conflicts happening throughout Africa. The Rohingya, a Muslim minority population in Burma, is being treated and persecuted significantly right now in East Asia. And so a lot of these conflicts against minority groups, against specific religions, is actually happening at a more uh, frequent rate. But what we also see is that some of these really tough situations that result in humanitarian crises are created by political conflicts in which it's really hard to come by a political solution. Um, even the example of Syria and what's happening with the Rohingya have to actually deal with political solutions in which both sides are not agreeing. And so that's the reason why we're seeing such humanitarian crises around the world. Now, if you look at the total numbers, half of the number of people who have been displaced actually come from only three countries. So Syria, Afghanistan, and Somalia are producing the world's largest number of uh, refugees and internally displaced persons. And that's significant because when you look at these countries, you understand that many of these places have been in conflict for such significant periods of time. Um, two years ago, I went to Jordan, which is a place where they house significant numbers of Syrian refugees. Um, and if you look at this camp, it is literally a wasteland. And there's a reason why they house refugees in places like this, because they don't want their refugees necessarily coming into local communities. Um, and so they set up these camps for them in which they uh, reside. Um, and so the Washington Post actually did a series um, of documentaries and storytellings of the refugees that they've encountered. Um, and I just want to highlight two of them for you because as we talk about the millions and the hundreds of thousands, ultimately the refugee crisis is about the one. 
It's about the one individual, the one story, the one person who's impacted, and each of these numbers represents an individual story. Now, Abdul Rahman Ahmed is 104 years old. He looks like he's 70, doesn't he? But when you look at this picture, what he said is that he hasn't had teeth for 34 years because his wife kissed them out with all of her kisses. Um, and he was a farmer in Syria who farmed watermelon and lentils and chickpeas. And he said that from the very beginning of his time um, in Syria, he lived through the Ottoman Empire. He lived through the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's lived through the Syrian war. He's lived through the Iranian revolution. He's lived through all of those things in his region, and he's never felt forced or threatened to leave his home. And it wasn't until he was over 100 years old that he felt the need to leave everything that he knew that was familiar to him and go to another country that he's never been to before. And being 104 years old, he knows that he's probably going to not return back to his home, but actually going to die in a place that he's never been to before. Now, he's disabled. He's confined to a wheelchair. He has to live in a 6 by 10 tent with many of his family members. Um, but he still has a good attitude about it because he says, you know, God will take care of my children and, you know, who knows where I'm going to end up. Um, and so he is just one of the mil many millions that have been displaced by the Syrian conflict. But we also see in the story of Huda Kalaf, she's a 34-year-old Syrian mother of three young children. She remembers during the Syrian conflict, she was pleading with her husband not to go on and fight. But when the Syrian forces started bombing her local village, her husband felt like he couldn't just stay in the house. So the night that he picked up arms and actually went out to fight was a night that the Syrian um, armed forces actually um, shot him through the heart, um, and he immediately died that evening. Now, her, Huda's husband's family knew that the Syrian forces knew who he was and who his family was. So they actually went to her house and said, they're going to come looking for you this evening, so you have to flee tonight. So she, with her three children, went into a truck convoy and, and crossed the border into Jordan, and where she was interviewed for the Washington Post story. Now, her story is interesting because not only did they become refugees, she was pretty much widowed, and her children became almost orphaned. And these are the three categories of vulnerability that you hear repeatedly mentioned in the Bible. And so imagine her story of not having a husband, her children not having a father, and then being refugees where they're dependent upon the host community to provide for the things that they have. Now, most refugee situations around the world, um, there's three durable solutions because in most cases, we want refugees and refugees themselves desire to actually be able to go home. And in certain situations where there's safety and peace in their home countries, they are able to return. And we call that solution voluntary repatriation. And hopefully for the Syrian people and for other refugees, they are eventually able to return back to the peaceful communities in which they resided. But oftentimes what we'll see is that a lot of refugees will end up in host countries like in Jordan and Lebanon for 5, 10, even almost 15 years. The UN actually estimates that most refugees will live in a refugee camp on average 17 years. So many kids will be born in camps in which they'll live their entire lives um, without ever having a concrete home or a permanent home to call their own. But the third option that's been getting a lot of attention in the Western world has been the issue of resettlement, of refugee resettlement, of what it means for us to be welcoming refugees that are not coming across the border, but that are in different areas of the around the world where there's significant conflict. Now, in the United States of America, this is actually taking an interesting turn because every year we resettle around 85,000 to 100,000 refugees per year. In fact, when President Reagan was in office, we resettled 200,000 refugees in a single year. And so many of the Vietnamese um, uh, friends or neighbors that you may have today, a lot of them actually came through the refugee crisis and under President Reagan's administration back in the early 1980s. But all of a sudden, this controversy around refugees became a pointed issue a few years ago um, after there were some terrorist attacks in Paris. And all of a sudden, people started to blame refugees as a cause for these terrorist attacks when that was fundamentally not true. None, no refugee participated in the terrorist attacks in Paris. But what it led to was a real fear in our country of whether or not we should even be letting in refugees into our communities. And it created a false narrative around refugees that we're continuing to debunk today. And there are some common myths that I've heard about refugees that I really think is important for us as a community to get right. Because in the age of alternative facts 
and um, less than truths, we, especially for those of us who are believers and followers of Christ, need to be bearers of the truth and uh, hold on to the truth as a foundation from which we ha ourselves have to be activating and engaging the world. So a couple of things to know about the refugee program specifically is that a refugee cannot choose to be resettled, which basically means if you're Huda or Abdul in another country, you can't raise your hand and say, I want to be resettled. The UN actually has to identify you as someone who's particularly vulnerable and then offer you resettlement. The other thing to notice um, about the refugee resettlement program is that it is the most rigorous way for someone to actually come into the United States of America. There is no one who enters our borders that have been as vetted as refugees are when they come through this program. On average, it takes a year and a half to two years. Every refugee has to be interviewed by Department of Homeland Security individual, um, and these individuals are then able to come into the United States of America. Since 1980, we resettled three million refugees in our country. Not a single refugee that has come through their program has taken the life of an American in a terrorist attack. Not a single one. I can't think of another government program that has had that kind of success. And so when we started to get challenges to the refugee program this year, many of us who worked in the program and with refugees were completely taken aback because we felt like there was a false narrative created in which we were responding to a non-existential threat. There was actually no threat that refugees pose, and you know, it perpetuated a narrative that the other, that the refugee, that the vulnerable was actually um, the ones that are intending us harm, and that was actually not the case. Um, one of these individuals that I've gotten to know is Mustafa. He is a 21-year-old Syrian refugee that was resettled to Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I live. Um, and he, um, when he came to the U.S., um, shared a story with me. And he basically told me that when he was in high school in Syria, he was a student that loved architecture and excelled a lot in architecture. Um, but he was at a medical appointment, and when he was there, um, his high school, there was a bomb that dropped on his high school, and three of his closest friends passed away. Now, many of you are college students, um, so imagine being in your high school, and imagine three of your closest friends being killed in a bombing. Um, and that's exactly what happened to Mustafa. Now, him and his family um, fled into Turkey, and he was actually eventually resettled to Baltimore, Maryland. And so when he came to Baltimore, he still wants to be an architect. Um, he actually is working at Whole Foods now, and he says he loves it because he gets access to really good food, um, and they pay him a decent wage. Um, but he's saving all of his wages to actually um, go to Anne Arundel Community College right in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and interestingly enough, I was actually sharing at uh, McLean or Grace Community Church um, over the summer, and he was in the audience because he's being uh, mentored and he's living with a Christian family that's actually been taking him to church. And what's so um, interesting about his story is that when I've gotten to know him and have d had dinner with him, you know, he grew up culturally Muslim, but what he said to me is, I don't believe in Allah anymore because I cannot believe that Allah would do this to my people. And so he struggled with his faith and he says, don't call me a Muslim anymore, even though that's my culture. But, you know, I'm exploring, you know, my faith and my religion. Um, and, you know, he's working all of that out right now. So since uh, the Paris attacks of a few years ago, there were 31 state governors that basically said, we do not specifically want Syrian refugees like Mustafa coming into my state. Again, a lot of these proclamations were born out of um, a fear that actually wasn't realized, but that was a tendency and the, the narrative that was driving the pol political conversation of that day. And in fact, it really culminated in the president actually targeting refugees earlier this year. Um, he uh, issued an executive order in which he basically um, said that we wanna suspend the refugee program for 120 days, we want to cut the number of refugees from 110,000 to 50,000, which is the lowest number it's ever been since 1980, the, the beginning of the program. Um, and there was a, a few other things that he did, but it created absolute chaos at airports. And we're still working in the legal system through what it means for a country to accept refugees. Now, the numbers of refugees that we've accepted over the past few years, it's around 85 to 100,000, like I mentioned before. That number makes up 0.0003% of our population. Now, in places like Lebanon and Jordan, the refugees make up 20 to 25% of their population. Imagine if the entire nation of Canada and a third of the nation of Mexico were to empty themselves into our borders within five years, 
And that's exactly what places in Lebanon and Jordan are actually experiencing right now. So when we in the West are trying to close our doors against a very, very small number of refugees, we really have to ask the question, are we even responding well to the worst refugee crisis of our time? And Richard Stearns of World Vision actually said this once. He said, in Germany, they've accepted nearly a million asylum seekers into their country. He said, we should move the Statue of Liberty from the New York Harbor to Berlin because they're doing a lot more to welcome the huddle masses than we here in the United States of America. And to a certain degree, when you look at the numbers, that's probably true when you look at the global response to the refugee crisis. Now, the refugee crisis and our acceptance of a small number of refugees is just a small portion of the overall immigrants that we accept here in the United States of America. Just this past week, there was a lot of controversy because um, President Trump decided to terminate um, DACA, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, for 800,000 individuals um, in our country. Now, many of these individuals, or all of them, actually came before the age of 16. Uh, they were individuals who didn't come out of their own choice here without authorization. Their parents brought them here. And so many of them, I've gotten to know a few of them, they didn't even know they were here illegally until they were applying to college. And then when they couldn't actually access any financial aid, that's when their parents told them that they were here without documentation. A few years ago, um, or about 10 years ago, when I was writing my book, Welcoming the Stranger, um, I was at my parents' home right here in Northwest Philly, and they took me to a Korean Presbyterian church in Horsham, and they said, you really need to get prayed for because you're really behind in your book writing. So I went into my Korean church, and I met with my youth pastor, and he prayed for me. But before he prayed for me, he actually said this. He said, I'm so glad you're writing this book on immigration because uh, there's a handful of Korean and documented kids in the youth group that you grew up in. And he said, you remember when you used to go to Mexico and go on all these missions trips? And he said, we don't go on those trips anymore because these undocumented Korean kids, if they left the country, they actually wouldn't be able to come back in. So now they've done missions trips to you know, inner city Philadelphia and all these different places, but they don't go overseas anymore because a lot of Korean kids are actually undocumented. Now, this was flooring to me because I had no idea there were Korean people that were undocumented, but there's a significant number of Koreans that are here without documentation. When I was on Capitol Hill um, uh, advocating for immigration reform, I remember one day I saw a group of guys in green t-shirts that were all on the hill doing immigration reform. And as I looked at their t-shirts, they actually said legalize the Irish because they had mostly come from the New England area to DC to advocate for immigration reform. And they were saying, oh, there's thousands of undocumented Irish immigrants in New England, but no one ever talks about us because no one thinks we're the face of undocumented immigrants. So when we talk about undocumented immigrants, it's really important to emphasize and understand that many of these individuals actually are coming from a diverse number of places. So when you think about the DACA recipients, the individuals who came here as youth without with their parents, it's really important to remember that about 76% of these DACA recipients are actually employed, which is a huge percentage. And there's a, about 20% of them who are actually only in school, but there's a large number of them that actually go to school and work at the same time. This was a decision that President Obama made to give these individuals who didn't have a social security number or work authorization to then get some kind of work authorization and uh, temporary legal status so that they can actually continue on in their education. Um, several students that I've talked with that are DACA recipients say that if they have their status revoked in the next six months or so, that they're gonna have to drop out of medical school. Um, I have other students that, um, there's a paramedic actually who was responding to the hurricane um, in Texas, in Houston, Hurricane Harvey, and he said that if he had lost his DACA status, that he wouldn't be able to save the many people that he saved as a paramedic in the Houston hurricane. Um, and so these are the individuals and the faces of DACA recipients, people who are called dreamers, who know no other home than the United States of America. If they lose their status in March, as the president has decided, without Congress passing any kind of legislation, it means that about 30,000 individuals a month are going to start to lose their status, which will mean that they will be vulnerable to deportation from our country back to a country they actually don't remember, don't know the language of, and culturally um, have, have never been there or um, don't want to go there at all.
Now, I talked a little bit about the stories and the individuals, and I think it's a good foundation for us to start engaging in a conversation. But I think for those of us who follow Jesus and those of us who want to be faithful to the scriptures, it's really important for us not just to base our response on an economic argument or a political or social argument, but to actually fundamentally root our response in what the scripture teaches. Uh, when we did a survey a few years ago, we found that about half of the individuals that we, um, of the church leaders that we uh, interviewed said that uh, their church has a real fear of immigrants and of specifically refugees that are coming into our communities. And I can understand why, because if you live in a community where everyone looks like you and you hear on the news that there's terrorists infiltrating your country through the refugee program, of course, anyone would be scared. I would be scared. But what we know are the facts and what we know is also a scriptural response. Um, I grew up in a community and I, you know, read the Bible through and through, but it wasn't until several years ago that I started reading the book, uh, the Bible, through the lens of those who are on the margins, of those who are marginalized. And for each of you, I would actually urge you, if you want to read the Bible in a new way, read the Bible through the lens of those who are oppressed, of those who are marginalized, because it will fundamentally shift your perspective on how the Bible was written and the narrative that God is weaving through the nation of Israel and ultimately through us as his people. Um, but when you read through Genesis to Revelation, what you see is that almost every single biblical character actually was an immigrant or a refugee at one point or another. And that migration experience allowed them to build a relationship with God. So we see in the story of Abraham, he was called by God to leave his homeland and to go to another land that God would show him. Abraham didn't know where he was going. He didn't know how he was going to get there or who was going to provide for him. But by him moving and leaving everything behind, he was trusting in God that God would provide for him and God would show him the way. But what you also see through the story of Joseph, he was literally a victim of human trafficking because he was sold into slavery by his brothers and had to cross into Egypt in caravans. And he was in that situation for many, many years. We see in the story of Ruth, she was literally a migrant worker working in the fields when Boaz noticed her. And Boaz noticed her as an immigrant worker whose character was shown in the fact that she was gleaning the fields and caring for her mother-in-law at that time. But perhaps the greatest of immigrant of all was Jesus himself. Now, many of us, when we celebrate Christmas, celebrate Mary and Joseph and the three wise men and perhaps a donkey and a sheep. But we don't have the story or the figure of King Herod, even though that was critical to the Christmas story. In fact, when you know that Jesus was born in the manger um, and there was an edict out that he was supposed to be killed, killed off, Mary and Joseph literally had to take their baby son into Egypt in order to save his life. So when Jesus says in Matthew 25, I was a stranger and you welcome me, he is literally saying that because he knows what it feels like to be a stranger and a refugee without at home. Now, Jesus himself was a Middle Eastern refugee. He was not a European refugee. He was not an American refugee. He literally was a Middle Eastern refugee. Not only was he from the Middle East, he was single and he was male. And if you look at the demographics of who Jesus was, he actually fits the category of someone we've actually been trying to keep out of our country over the past six months. So my question to all of us is, if Jesus were born today, would he even be someone that we accept here in the United States of America? Now, in the Old Testament, we see the word immigrant as ger or G-E-R. It's actually mentioned 92 times in the Old Testament alone. Um, repeatedly in the Old Testament, you see immigrants and widows and orphans grouped together as people who are particularly vulnerable. So you see in Deuteronomy 7, or 10, 17, it says, love the Lord your God is the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords. He enacts justice for orphans and widows, and he loves immigrants, giving them food and clothing. That means that you must also love immigrants. Um, and you see in uh, Psalm 146, the Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless of the poor. Malachi 3, 5, I'll be quick to testify against those who defraud aliens of justice. And you see this commandment of justice for immigrants, of caring for immigrants, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. Um, but what you also see is this narrative weave throughout the New Testament as well. Um, all of us know the story of the Good Samaritan in which Jesus says your neighbor um, is someone on the side of the road who is beaten up and beaten up. And the Samaritan was the one who showed most mercy on him, even at cost to himself. But this idea of loving the stranger and hospitality is something that's fundamental to the New Testament. Philo um, 
love of the stranger, Xenia, is something that's repeated in various verses of scripture. It says in Hebrews 13, 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for you may be entertaining angels without knowing it. The opposite of a biblical style hospitality is a xenophobia or a fear of the stranger, which actually has become the mantra of um, some of our political narrative in our country today. But even for us to consider hospitality, for us, we oftentimes think hospitality is a Martha Stewart spread where, you know, we have a roast turkey and the best mac and cheese and all this amazing food at the table. But the biblical idea of hospitality goes broader than that. It doesn't just say to invite your friends and your family, but to invite the stranger and even your enemy to the table of God. I think the challenge for us, for those of us who follow Christ, is to know that are we welcoming um, the stranger? Are we welcoming others at risk to ourselves? And are we welcoming people who even hate us to the table of God? That is what's revolutionary about the Christian faith. And I believe that is what's going to distinguish us from the responses of the world. In fact, when we love and welcome the very people the world wants us to hate, I believe that is when we will advance the mission of God. Not when we do like the world and hate upon and fear the very people made in the image of God. 2 Timothy 1, uh, 1.7 is a verse that I just think is so apropos for the times that we live in. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Each of those are critically important. Um, having love clothe all of our actions, knowing we walk with the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, knowing we have a sound mind to think through and hold on to the truth and be bearers of, of factual information, that is a part of our uh, Christian walk. But when we allow fear to cripple us and actually dominate our response to treating and welcoming others whom God has placed in our communities, that is when I believe we will cripple the mission of God. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the economics and the social aspects of this, but what I want us to also understand is not just loving and serving the immigrant neighbor, but also understanding that I believe there are divine spiritual purposes behind the movement of people. In fact, it says in Acts 17 that from one man, God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. What this means is that it's not an accident that your favorite in, uh, restaurant is owned by you know, Thai immigrants that came from Thailand or that your dry cleaners is owned by some Chinese immigrants or that your you know, auto mechanic's Korean or your neighbor's Indian. It actually says that the reason for the diversity that we have in our communities is because God is orchestrating the movement so that they can be in a place where they can actually encounter him for the first time. In Matthew 20, it says for us to make disciples of every nation. I believe in loving our immigrant neighbors that we are not only just fulfilling the great commission to reach all the nations, but carrying out the great commandment, which is actually to love our neighbor, uh, immigrant neighbors into the kingdom of God. Now, earlier this year, um, we released a letter after the executive order was issued in which we said we as Christians, we as leaders of the church do not believe that this narrative against refugees, that us excluding refugees is representative of our faith. And we had, um, just in one weekend, over 600 church leaders sign onto the statement. Uh, we had people like uh, Tim and Kathy Keller and Eugene Cho, John Perkins, and many, many others. And literally within a week, we had over 6,000 church leaders um, and activists sign on to this letter. Um, when we first released it, we wanted to get a church pastor in every state, so we were missing North Dakota for two days. Uh, but then we finally got someone from North Dakota, and we're able to say that we got a pastor from every state when we actually released the letter. But what this demonstrates to you is that the church is standing in the gap, and we're actually using our voice to fight back against this narrative that has been created against refugees and immigrants, against people made in the image of God, to say that we are defined by our welcoming of the stranger. We are actually defined by how we treat the very people um, the world wants us to hate with love and with welcome. Um, oftentimes, we think that migration is changing the face of our country, and it is. But I think for us who follow Jesus and understand his greater purposes in the world, that migration is not just changing the face of our country, it is literally changing the face of Christianity. In some of the churches that we've worked with that have reached out to their refugee and immigrant neighbors, they have seen 
complete revival happening in the churches. Um, in a church in Nashville that we work with, they picked up Bhutanese refugees um, at the airport, and uh, they basically said that, oh, we showed them a Jesus video, and in one Sunday service, we baptized over 60 Bhutanese refugees. And these Bhutanese refugees told their Baptist counterparts, don't pick up Bhutanese anymore at the airport because I'm going to pick them up. And so these Bhutanese refugees have planted Bhutanese churches. They've picked up their Bhutanese refugees, shown them the Jesus video. And we have literally seen revival, not just among the Bhutanese, but among Somalis and Syrians and Iranians and others who are really enlivened with the spirit of Jesus in their um, conversations. So Martin Luther King Jr. once said that we're all called to be, to be the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that should only be an initial act. If we see someone beaten up along the side of the road and someone beaten up along the side of the road, we have to, at a certain point, say, what is wrong with the Jericho Road? We, as followers of Christ, have an incredible opportunity this year, not just to serve our neighbors and to love them well right here in the city of Philadelphia, but we also have an incredible opportunity to start changing the narrative about who refugees are and who we are as followers of Christ. I believe we have an incredible responsibility to be a public witness, to actually change the conversation, and to be a Christian conscious to our nation when it comes to people who are particularly vulnerable in our country. It says that Mar uh, Martin Luther King Jr. concludes his quote by saying, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. At World Belief, um, we've wanted to create many avenues for you guys to get engaged. Um, and so if you go to worldbelief.org slash advocate, you can actually sign up for newsletters um, in which we're actually sending out information on a regular basis to you about ways to get engaged. Um, and so if you go on that website, there's an opportunity to sign up there and also to contact your elected officials about supporting DACA recipients and DREAMers in our cities and in our communities. Um, but I would also encourage you to really get plugged into the new sanctuary movement to local organizations right here in the city of Philadelphia that are serving refugee and immigrant neighbors. And I would say this, um, when I've gotten to know Mustafa and other refugees in my city of Baltimore, um, not only have I had some of the best food I've ever had in my life, because I've had some really amazing Persian food, um, but I've also received more in those relationships than I felt like I was able, ever able to give. Um, it's in the prayer of uh, Francis that uh, Shane just talked about, which is, you know, oftentimes in giving, we actually receive more. And so I would really encourage you as followers of Jesus and as students on this amazing campus of Eastern to get engaged, to use your voice, to serve with love, to pursue justice, and to really um, elevate this conscious of what Jesus would ask us to do um, in our country today. So thank you guys so much. And... Yeah, I'm open for any questions for the next few minutes, I guess. Thank you, guys. So I think I maybe have time for like two questions. So um, does anyone have a question? Yes. Yes. 
That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And if you can, just come up to the front maybe afterwards so people can connect with you. Um, one maybe last question or comment. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. I will be available, I think, for lunch. So if anyone wants to talk to me, I'm available. But thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.